want to talk to you this morning about a subject that may be difficult for us to hear. Nevertheless, let God be true and every man a liar. Is that all right? Yeah. Want to say how thankful I am to be able to see Amy in our presence today. I tell you, time waits for no one. It seems like just yesterday we were sending her off to Tennessee State. And now she's back having graduated. Amen, somebody. We thank you, sir. God be praised. Thank God for keeping her uh, for four years. We look forward to what God has in store for her in her life uh, as an adult. Amen, somebody. I know she thinks she's already a mountain uh, I want to talk to you this morning about living spiritual versus feeling spiritual. Living spiritual versus feeling spiritual. We're going to look and examine James chapter 1, a familiar text, but we want to look at it like we've never looked at it before. James chapter 1, and for us to set the tone, want us to understand that beginning with verse 16, the context specifically focuses on God's word and the truth thereof. Amen, somebody. And it's important because when he continues, he does not break the text. He's continuing to speak about God's word, about the truth. Amen, somebody. James chapter 1, starting with verse 16. If you have it, say amen. amen. The word of God says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Is that what your Bible says? Every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above. Nothing that's good, nothing that's perfect originates down here with us. Amen, somebody. Are we getting this? All right. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator and sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes of his own will, notice this, of his own will, he begot us, or he brought us forth, notice how, by the word of truth. Are we getting this? He begot us, he brought us forth, by the word of truth. In other words, none of us, none of us could be children of God, born of God, born again, without the word of truth. Where there is no word of truth, there will be no children of God. Amen, somebody. Notice, he brought us or begot us by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Are we getting that? Now watch this. A kind of first fruits is, when we look at this word first fruits, it's not used here in the sense that it's used in the Old Testament that you would think of with first fruits, the first portion of your produce. Amen, somebody. Here, 
it speaks specifically and gives reference to the moral creation of God, mankind, all right, being affected by Christianity. I know that seems generalized and everything like that, but understand this. Christianity, Christ, has affected mankind. Are y'all getting this? Stay with me now. Watch this. As people or of persons who by faith and obedience to Christ Jesus and to his gospel, we are now, as a kind of first fruits, we are now people who become set aside and consecrated to God for his divine will and purposes. Are y'all understanding that? All right? This comes after the similitude or a remote text that will help us to understand this would come from Revelation chapter 14 and the verse number 4, which says, These were the redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. In other words, because you and I have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have now become consecrated. We have now become set aside or set apart for God's purposes. Amen, somebody. Among all the people in the world, we belong to God. Are y'all getting this? And therefore, we have to understand, Christ Jesus is the true fulfillment of first fruits. He's the first of that kind. But we are a kind of first fruits. In other words, God is seeking to perfect Christian character in us that we might become a new kind of being. No longer human beings, but a new kind of being. Are y'all getting this? You see, we, we need to understand that God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, can make a new kind of being af, af, or after or uh, out of ordinary human beings. God can take ordinary human beings and make a new kind of being with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are y'all getting this? Uh, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible so that we can understand it. In other words, as Christians, amen somebody, as Christians, we are essentially a new race of people. We have a new DNA that scientists can't track. We have a spiritual DNA. Are y'all getting this? And as a new race of people with a new spiritual DNA, we've been set apart by God to lead the rest of God's creation, mankind, and to be, and, and to becoming a part of the only race that matters. Y'all ain't get that. We're responsible for leading all mankind to the new race. Amen, somebody. The only race that matters. Amen, somebody. And that's the Christian race. Are we getting this? You see, John chapter 1, the verses 11 through 13, Jesus says... Or it says, he came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. To those who believe. And this believe means to obey, to adhere, to trust in and rely on. In his name. Notice this. Who were born not of blood, 
nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. Another translation says it like this. They were born, they were not born God's children by physical nature, nor because of any human plan or desires. God himself was the one who made them his children. Thank you, Jesus. So understand, when we talk about true religion, it has its origin in God, not man. God, who is the source of everything good and perfect. All right? But I want you to notice something else about true religion. Amen, somebody? True religion is evidenced in our manner of life and living and not just how you and I feel. Notice then James chapter 1, the verse 22 again says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Notice this, deceiving your own selves. Amen, somebody. But I want you again to understand that context is very important. So I want to go back up if I can real quick to verse 19 of the same chapter because after he lets us know that he begot us of the word of truth, he still, the context, as I told you before, is still talking about truth. It's still talking about the word of God. Because he says in verse 19, wherefore, wherefore, he's continuing, all right? So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to do what? Hear. Hear what? The truth, the word. That's the context. That's the subject here. Be swift to hear. Amen, somebody. In other words, eager to receive the word with all readiness of mind. You and I right now should have a readiness of mind. We shouldn't be thinking about what we're going to do tomorrow, passing babies, scrolling through our phones. Amen, somebody. We need to be giving our full attention to the word of God. He says, be swift to hear. But notice then he says, slow to speak. Slow to speak, what do you mean? Slow to speak back at God's word. Because here's the key. Every time you and I listen and hear the word of God, whether it's preached or taught, it doesn't always feel good. Amen, somebody. We can be honest. Amen, somebody. This means slow to speak back at God's word. One who is, watch this, a person who is quick to speak rather than to hear is a very poor learner. You ever try to talk to people about something that you know that they don't know nothing about, and when you talk to them, they already got something to say? Which tells you and I that they're not listening. They're not really learning. Amen, somebody. Some people listen to you to respond, not to hear. Y'all ain't get that. I said some people listen to respond and not to hear. In other words, they're waiting for you to just take a, a breath so that they can talk. So he said, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. And notice this, slow to wrath. Watch this. This is not speaking to the world. This is speaking to Christians. Christians who don't like what God's word says about certain subjects, certain aspects, certain matters of life, and therefore they either ignore or teach contrary to the truth about it. In other words, there's some things, amen somebody, there's some things 
that we hear from God's word and we just uh, try to act like we didn't hear it. Or we try to make it fit our life. Amen. So we can continue to be the same person that we've always been. I told you this was going to be a difficult lesson. But he says slow to wrath because notice verse 20 for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Amen somebody. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. In other words we are not to allow ourselves to continue to make provisions for the lust of the flesh. Because here's, here's something we need to understand. We know that God will provide. Amen somebody. But I'm here to tell you, when it comes to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, Satan will always provide. Amen, somebody. Y'all remember the story of Jonah? How when Jonah made up his mind to do contrary to God's will? You ever notice in that story when he wanted to sail, everything fell in place for him to run away from God. And I'm here to tell you, when, we, when you and I want to do, make up our minds to do contrary to God's will, everything falls in place for us to do that. Isn't that amazing? See, Satan will always provide opportunities for us to do evil and wrong. Always. And then he'll try to work with our mindset to try and justify what we're doing. So he says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. In other words, as we expounded on before, this term is a medical term here of wax build up in the ears. And basically life, our lives sometimes, we're preoccupied with things in life and it affects how we hear. So when we come and we hear the word of God, we got so much wax built up from the world, we can't really receive what God has to say. So he's saying, amen, take a spiritual Q-tip, clean out that wax, amen, somebody, so that you can really receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. You see, let me say it simply like this. We need to check our attitudes when it comes to the word of God. We need to be extremely cautious to be meek, to be humble towards God's word. Because notice this. You ever notice how we're really strong and, and hold fast strongly to certain aspect of the doctrine? Amen, somebody. If I brought an organ up here right now, I will be stoned. Amen, somebody. Are y'all getting my drift? All right. If I start praise dancing right now, y'all, I would get stoned. So there's certain aspects of the doctrine when it comes to baptism, when it comes to the plan of salvation, when it comes to worship. We're strong on those. But what about when it comes to the doctrine, when it applies to our practical daily life? Brother Clark talked this morning about forgiveness. Was it wax in your ears this morning? Amen, Brother Clark. Our inability to forgive one another. And we already know that unless we forgive, we can't be forgiven. But see, when you got wax built up, you can come in here and, and sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and by. Amen, somebody, while holding a grudge with somebody right down in the other pew. Can't stand your guts, can't stand the sight of you. But I'm praising God. When it comes to forgiveness, 
when it comes to our compassion, when it comes to our love, when it comes to our treatment, one of another, where's our strength in holding fast to the doctrine then? And this is why it's so critical that we receive the word with meekness. The implanted word. Implanted means, or it speaks to that which is placed in, that which is engrafted, that which is established as a living union, and as a result, it enables something to develop. In other words, we have to be cautious of what ground the word falls on this morning. Is it thorny ground up here? Is it stony ground up here? Or is it good ground? And this is why our Lord himself said in John 15 and verse number 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and notice, I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, or apart from me, talking about fellowship and union, apart from me, apart from me, you can do nothing. And this means that we can do nothing, or we can do nothing, we will do nothing that will abound to our credit eternally. Amen, somebody. In other words, we want to do things that's going to abound to our credit eternally. We don't want to do things that don't matter in eternal wise anyway. We want to do those things that will abound to our credit to make heaven our home. Amen, somebody. And that's why true religion requires you and I to be doers of the word and not hearers only. You see, you and I will never truly do out of love what we haven't first humbled ourselves to receive with meekness. Did y'all get that? We'll never be able to do out of love what we haven't first truly received with meekness. Amen, somebody. In other words, you and I have to be careful what we're telling God when he speaks to us through his word. Because we could say something like this to God. Yeah, God, I hear you. Now, y'all know what I meant just by the way I said that. I hear you, God. I mean, I heard you. But I, I'm not thinking about doing what you said. I heard you. Is that all right? So we have to be careful because our feelings are not the standard that God gives to us by which we are to measure our spirituality. Many of us feel spiritual. Feel spiritual. But are we truly living spiritual? There's a difference. Our feelings are not the standard. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Paul said this, we don't dare compare ourselves with those who think so much of themselves and who tell you how important they are. But they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant and foolish they are. You see, when you and I go around and we compare ourselves by each other, then we can probably think, they yeah, I'm spiritual. Because everybody else is so wicked in my perception. Amen. And we always think that we're better than somebody else. 
But see, when you and I look into the mirror, amen, somebody, when we look into the mirror, and this is why, again, it says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. A doer means here, not just from time to time. Did y'all get that? You say, you better hurry up and preach this sermon. Uh, did y'all hear that? Not just from time to time. But rather, it is a doer here means coming into a state and a condition of fulfilling, carrying out, and performing and obeying the will of God. A state of it. A condition of it. In other words, that's what you practice. And watch this, Christians. When we practice what God has instructed us to do, you don't get extra credit for that. You don't get extra credit for that. Oh, Brother Willie, you know, man, uh, they made me mad, man, and, and I ain't slap them out. You're not supposed to. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been faithful. You're supposed to be faithful. We want some credit for something we're supposed to do. Notice, not hearers only. Hear one who merely or only listens, one who only reads, one who only studies the Word of God, but does nothing about it. You listen to it, you read it, you even study it but you do nothing about it. Notice then what this will cause you and I to do as we hasten to our close. Verse 22 says, again, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. This is critical because Deceiving here means to reason falsely, means to miscalculate and to mislead your own self into thinking that you are in good standing before God. Let me break it down like this. Hearing good sermons, hearing good lessons, hearing good classes, Amen, those that we agree with anyway. But yet doing nothing in response to those messages. Wonderful message, Brother Willie. Great class, Brother Clark. But it's really not great and wonderful until I apply it in my life. See, this deceiving literally refers to living a life which is contrary, diluted, and when compared side by side with the truth, a fraud. Therefore, it refers to the one who lives by a standard of what they feel that which has an appearance of truth, but is ultimately unauthentic and will later disappoint you and let you down. You see, speaks to one who lives their lives by their own reasoning, by their own thinking, by their own feeling contrary to the truth in a misleading, erroneous, and self-righteous way. And I'm here to tell you this morning that our feelings are misleading. And not only are they, they mis, they're misleading, but they're unreliable. Amen. Amen, somebody. You and I can no longer afford to serve God by how we feel. You say, well, why do you say that? 
because you know I'm learning that I can't even trust myself with myself. I'm talking about me. Want me to say it for you? You can't trust yourself with yourself. Amen, somebody. Notice that. We can't even trust ourselves with our own selves. The psalmist says it like this in Psalm 19 in the verses 12 and 13. Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13. None of us, none of us know all the sins in us. So he says, cleanse and deliver me, O Lord, from hidden and secret faults. Keep your servant from willful and deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. In other words, Lord, I'm, I'm trying to search. I'm, I'm tired of searching myself. As, as the psalmist said, David said in Psalm 139 in the last two verses, he said, you search me. You find in me that's whatever's contrary to your will and you lead me in the paths of everlasting. Because I can't do it. I'm a cheat. Amen, somebody. And that's why he then illustrates verses 23 and 24, going back to James. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. I liken it like this. When we get up in the morning, amen, you don't get up in the morning looking like you look right now. Amen, somebody. We get up in the morning looking into the mirror, amen, somebody. We can clearly see what needs to be cleaned up, what needs to be washed up. Is that all right? However, sometimes, just sometimes, when you and I get up and we, we look in the mirror, we see what needs to be cleaned up. We need to see what we need, we see what needs to be washed up. Sometimes something occurs. Sometimes things happen and we, we're called away. We're interrupted. Amen, somebody. And we have to attend to something immediately. Amen, somebody. And when that happens, guess what happens? We forget what we look like. We forget what we look like. We looked in the mirror. We, we, we saw that, oh, man, I got to clean this up. But something interrupted us. Amen, somebody. Something interrupted us, and now we're busy doing something, preoccupied with something, and we forgot what we looked like. But I'm here to tell you, all day long, other people notice what you and I forgot. They went out the house got matter in their eyes. Matter. Y'all remember that? Matter. Got stuff on their lips. Lord, have mercy. Pull thing. Amen, somebody. But watch this. You see, the same thing happens spiritually. This is the mirror. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. This is the mirror. And every time we hear it, we get a glimpse of what we truly look like. But because we're interrupted by the world and what's going on in the world, sometimes as soon as we hit that door, we forget what we look like. Amen, somebody. Y'all ain't getting this. We forget what we look like. You see, and we go on the same person that we were. But here's the danger. When you and I make a practice out of that, of just looking at ourselves, seeing what we look like, it didn't go away, and for being a forgetful hearer, amen, somebody? 
when we continue to do that, then we will fall into this life cycle of circumventing. You say, well, what is that? To circumvent means to try and avoid, avoid something dishonestly, amen somebody, or dishonestly try to get around what truly needs to change. So when, when, when we make a practice out of just hearing and then going away and forgetting, amen somebody, we fall into a lifestyle of circumventing, trying to get around what needs to be changed. Amen somebody. Y'all ain't getting this. All right? So trying to get around it, we, we, we make every justification. We look at other people. We do everything we can to get around what we need to do. And that's why sometimes in the church, in the congregation, there's so much hypo hypocrisy and criticism one of another because everybody's focusing on somebody else and not themselves. That's why our homes are dysfunctional at best because everybody in the home is looking at somebody else and not themselves. Everybody, you ever notice how when it comes to our thinking, everybody else needs to change but us? I hope they listening to this. Amen. Say it again. <laughs> you the one who need to listen. You see? God not only sees the way you and I were, he sees how we are. And it's sad to say it's sad to say that most of us are more concerned about how we look to each other Amen. than how God sees us. Because God sees how we are, whether it bothers us or not. And that's why the Hebrew writer said this in Hebrews chapter 4, in the verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And that's why we run out of here sometimes saying, well, who told my business? Well, God already knows your business. The word exposes your business. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we all must give account. We're so concerned about who sees me doing this and that. God sees us all day long. God, here's what we say all day long, and I pray you come back this afternoon because t this afternoon we're talking about the tongue and how there's one thing we can't get away from is our tongue. Try to pretend all you want to. Your tongue will expose you. You see, he says, finally, as we close, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, what is this? This is God's word. This is the law of Christ. This phrase right here, perfect law of liberty, is the exact same of that which was used in 1 Corinthians 13, 10, that which is perfect. And Paul said, when that which is perfect is come, that which is perfect is that which is completed. Speaking of God's divine communication of teaching and instruction, because at that time, 
when the Bible was not complete, when God's divine communication was not complete, they only did those uh, gifts of communication in part. In part. Amen, somebody. All right? But now we have that which is complete, that which is perfect. Is that all right? The perfect law of liberty. In other words, God's word sets us free from being captive to our former carnal way of thinking. So notice this. He says, but who, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and notice this and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So notice this. The point is this. Only those Christians who continually practice and thoroughly examine God's word are able to see and know for sure what's wrong in their lives. In other words, you and I have to keep this in our hearts that we may not sin against God. I, ain't, I don't got time to be looking at you. Amen, somebody. You don't have time to be looking at me. Amen, somebody. You say, well, I got to deal with you. Amen. And God has got to deal with you too. Amen, somebody. That's what we missed from class this morning, Clark. When we talked about extending what God has extended to us. You see, it's so easy for us to ask God for something, but we don't want to extend what God gives to us to somebody else. Lord, have mercy. You see, it's only when we continue in this, doing it, examining it, that we can see what's wrong with us. All right? In our lives. And see, the perfecting of our character and ultimately our eternal salvation depends on you and I practicing and examining this daily. Amen. Daily. Daily. Amen, somebody. So that we can translate it into our lives and produce fruit to the glory of God. We must not only look into God's word, we must do what it requires. Because only this will enable us to become that new kind of being. Amen. We know the, 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 the scripture text from Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of our minds. Your mind and my mind will never be renewed if we don't continue in this. Not only looking into it, but doing it. Amen, somebody. I want you to notice this. You see, a Christian not doing, did y'all get that? A Christian not doing is not only not continuing in God's word, but also not continuing in God's favor. Y'all need to get that. A Christian not doing is not only not continuing in God's word, but also not continuing in God's favor. John 13, 17, we finish with this. Our Lord said himself, if you know these things, Happy are you if you do them. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Now this word happy is just outstanding. It means blessed by God. 
It speaks to favorable circumstances, but not in the world sense. Did y'all get that? Which is based upon the state of our external circumstances and conditions in this life. You see, if we have favorable circumstances, the world teaches us that means that everything in our lives is, is cool. That's not what this is talking about. You see, this word here specifically refers to one whom God makes fully satisfied. Not because of favorable circumstances in this life, but because God's own indwelling in us through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit as his children. In other words, it's the one who is in this world, yet independent of the world, as his or her satisfaction comes from God himself and not from favorable circumstances in this life. I always say we're going to have to mature to get to the point where God is enough. God is enough. And truth be told, as we said last Sunday evening, it takes for you and I to get to a point in life where we have nothing and no one. Nothing and no one. Because then, for the very first time, we can discover that God has always been enough. Always. I thank God for loving us enough to allow us to experience that. We think sometimes when we experience things like that, having no one and nothing in our lives, we think that we did something wrong and that God is punishing us. When the truth of the matter is, God is allowing us to come to know that his grace is sufficient. Always. It's all about him, not about us. I've said enough. If there's anyone present with us today who's not obeyed the gospel, you can come. You say, well, what do I need to do to be saved? There is a plan of salvation that God has that originates with God, not with man. Amen, somebody? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. We must receive the faith that God gives through the preaching and teaching of his word. That faith produces within us a belief to believe what we heard. We must then be willing to repent of our sins, turn from the world and turn to God. Confess with our mouths, Romans 10, 9 and 10, for confession is made unto salvation. Confess what? Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That God raised him from the dead on the third day. And then in obedience, we must be buried in baptism. Notice, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen, somebody. As I always say, what makes us a Christian, the same plan that makes us a Christian is the same plan that adds us to the church. Acts 2, 47, and the Lord added to the church, the church, the ecclesia, the spiritual called out, Daily, those who were, notice, being saved. The saved God puts in the church. Amen, somebody. Aren't you glad that God put you in? Because when God puts you in, no person can take you out. Amen, somebody. So consider where you are as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement.